QuickBooks Online 2024 Transaction List by Date Report. Get ready and some coffee because we're diving into it with Intuit's QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are online in our browser searching for QuickBooks Online Test Drive, looking for the result that has Intuit.com and the URL Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks selecting the United States version of the software and verifying that we're not a robot. Opening up the major financial statement reports like we do every time. The reports on the left hand side in the favorites, right clicking on the balance sheet to open link in a new tab, right clicking on the profit and loss, otherwise known as the income statement. Open the link in a new tab, go into that middle tab, closing the hamburger. We're going to change the range. We're going back in time. Rewind 010123 tab, 123 tab, and run the report. Tabbing to the right, that's the profit and loss or income statement. The hamburger needs to be closed, and then we'll change that range again. 010123 tab, 123123 tab, running to refreshing. Let's go back to the first tab once again. That's the setup process that we do every time. Remembering that the balance sheet and the income statement, major two financial statement reports right there. All other reports, for the most part, are generally giving more information about one or multiple line items on those major balance sheet and income statement financial statement reports let's go back to the reports on the left hand side close up the hamburger over here as well and scroll down to the for your accountant reports we went over an overview of what is included in here in a prior presentation and now we want to look at in more detail the transaction list by date report so this report is kind of similar to the general ledger that we looked at briefly last time. So a quick recap on that one. If I right click and open the general ledger, then this is going to give us all the detail, but it's going to give it by account. So if I change the range here from 010123 tab, 123123 tab and run this report, this gives us all like the transactions that happened, but it's giving it to us by account. You can see here we have the accounts that are that are going to be in order, the detail within it. Remember that each transaction that has been recorded has at least two accounts impacted. That's how the double entry accounting system uh, works. So if I'm looking at each of the one accounts and the activities within it, I'm really only looking at least at, at most one side, 50% of the transaction and sometimes there's going to be multiple accounts that will be uh, impacted. So this report, again, not as used possibly these days because you can possibly give this information to your accountant directly in the form of just the QuickBooks file, giving them access to it, in which case they can go to the actual balance sheet and income statement or trial balance and drill down on the transaction detail, which gives us that similar information, which is the transactions within each account by date. So if I go back and look at by contrast, let's go back to the first report. If we go to the transaction list by date, right clicking on this and opening a new tab. Now we're going to get something different. I'm going to close up the hamburger and we're going to change the range. So this is in the new format. So we'll hit the drop down up top and custom date range. I'm going to bring it from 010123 tab, 123123 tab, and it is refreshing automatically. So you can see here, it doesn't have the accounts up top and then the detail. It has all of the transactions listed by transaction type, this time in order by date only. 
So how does it then take into consideration that each transaction has multiple accounts, at least two for every transaction that is impacted? Well, it's gonna to try to list what happens by form, the transaction type, and it's gonna give the other side in the account over here. Oh, what did I do? Let's try to make this a little bit larger. So we've got the account and then, uh, and so we have the accounts that are gonna basically be impacted. Now it can only give basically two, Let's see if I can make this a little bit smaller. It's not as wide as I would like it to be. It can only really list two accounts that would be impacted per transaction in this case because they want to keep each transaction on one line each. So therefore, you might not have as much information as you otherwise would if it was able to have multiple lines, in which case you would report like a journal entry report that still could still be reported by date. Like, for example, many of these invoices. So if I go into an invoice, then you can see that we have the uh, accounts receivable here and the other side, the account, they didn't list an account. It used to be in the old reports that it would say that it was in a split, meaning there's multiple other accounts that were impacted. And therefore we can't just have two accounts that are included there because that wouldn't be totally inclusive of all the transaction that's happening with this form. So if I go into this one, for example, then you can see that we have our, our normal journal entry with an invoice would be an increase to an accounts receivable, the other side going to income. But then because we sold inventory, we would also have an impact on the inventory, the cost of goods sold, as well as the sales tax. So there's a lot going on with this transaction and we can't just report it if I close this out on just one line. So that means that we're going to be shortening some of these transactions. Now there's another report that gives us the more detail. If I go to the report on the left, we'll talk about it more in detail in a future presentation, but you could open the journal report just by contrast and let's change the range up top and we'll hit, this as the new format again. So we'll go from 010123 tab, 123123 tab. And so, so now you have, uh, the transactions that are happening still by date, but now it's given you the debits and credit format, but all of the accounts that are impacted. So this will be a much longer report, but it'll give you that more detail. We'll talk about it in future presentations. Also, if I go back on over here, you have the transaction detailed by account. Let's look at that by contrast or for contrast with our current report, opening that up. I'll pull that to the left, close up the hamburger, change the range we're going back to the custom range we're going from 010123 tab 123123 tab and so now note that this one still is given it basically by account here so we have you know the checking account and then the savings accounts and then and then the accounts receivable so it's still kind of listing it by account as opposed to the journal report which is listing the transactions by date and this transaction list by date report given all of the transactions by date. Okay, so what's the point of this one? Why might it be useful? How might we use it? Well, there's multiple ways that you can, you can use this report depending on what you're looking at. One way might be that if you're reviewing someone, if you're a supervisor or something like that, and you wanna see what data input people have done for a certain time frame, then of course you can use this report and you can see the transactions nice and easily on what has been input and and you can look at it uh, in detail of what has happened that way uh, if you're in a classroom setting it's a great report to be running for a similar purpose to see if what work has been done uh, for a particular time frame if you're taking a course like this this is a great report to kind of check our work as we go so when we get to a future course or section where we're actually doing data input and then doing like two months of data input, then we can check where we started before uh, the tra before we did the current, whatever we're doing in the current lecture. And we can say, well, is my balance sheet in balance in the prior period? If my balance sheet and income statement are correct, and then in the following lecture or in some following point, there's a difference. Now the balance sheet is off. So your numbers don't match my numbers as we go through the, the process. Well, then you, if you can't figure out what happened, we could then go to this report 
and, and try to tick and tie out which transaction is different. Oftentimes it'll be a date issue that something might be missing because there's a date issue and you can expand the date range and see if something was entered at a future point in time, which is often the case because QuickBooks will default to enter transactions in the current date, whereas we're, we might be working in the past or like in the future when we're working uh, a practice problem. That's another use for it. It also can be useful if you're sometimes in a billing situation. So if you're a bookkeeper or an accountant and you do bookkeeping at a, at a firm and you're trying to bill the client, how do you do that? Well, one way you can do that is you could just try to count your hours, try to get the time that people have worked on it using a job cost system and then, and then bill them based on an hourly rate based on whoever worked on it. However, that's a little bit difficult because the, the, the rates could change depending on who, who is working on it and how much time they spent on it. And it could lead to inconsistencies in the billing to the person receiving the bill, which can be kind of annoying because they might not be able to expect what the bill should look like or why it would be different from month to month. So sometimes you might say, well, look, I'm just gonna give you a monthly bill, but it'll be dependent upon how many transactions took place. So you might use this report to basically count the transactions. So you might run the report for like a month and then count the transactions. So you go from January to 01, 31 to, actually there's nothing in January. <laughs> Let's do it at the end of the month. Let's go from 12, 01, 23 tab, 12, 31, 23 tab. And then we might count the transactions and we have an agreement saying, uh, the start date can't go after the end date. I know that it's not after. The we, we might have an agreement saying, well, I'm going to bill based on the number of transactions. If you're within this range, I bill you so much. If it's in another range, I bill you so much and so on and so forth. That way it's consistent. And usually if there's going to be a higher month of activity, for example, if you're talking about a business that's seasonal, they're going to have some months that are going to be higher than other months. And that could be a way that you can be more consistent about your billing. It might be a little bit easier. You might say, well, how could you count these transactions? One way you can count these transactions possibly would be to export this to Excel. So we'll export it to Excel, open it up, and then we can just use the count function to count the transactions, right? So I'm gonna export it here. I'm gonna enable the editing and every line is a new transaction. So we can have, we have the different forms on each line. So if I go down to the bottom and I say, I want you, let's go to here. I'll say equals count and I just want to count the cells with stuff in it. Do do do. I'll go control shift up. Boom. Hold on. Let's do it again. Do, 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 do. And then enter. And so it didn't count it. What happened? I think it needs a number in it. So we could use a different count if function. So I'll put, I'll go over here and do it again. Equals count 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 C O U N T. There's our function control shift up and then I'll shift down. And then that's 89 transactions. Now we have a couple transactions here that have zero in it, but we shouldn't really normally have any zeros in it. So, so then you could say, okay, there's the transactions. There's 89 of them. Where does that lie in my billing structure that I have pre set up that I'm going to use to bill the clients? That, that way, if you can come up with a system like that, then I think that leads to longer kind of uh, assurances or, or more comfortableness between the, the bookkeeper and the client because now they, they, they see a more consistent, they can see exactly what is happening. It's not like an ambiguous hour, who in the firm is working on it? Why do you have different rates of different people that did the same work for the same billing? How come it's taking more time one you know thing to the other? So if you can come up with a system like that for your billing. I think that's easier. Now, it's still not a perfect system because notice that some of these transactions are more difficult than others, such as if you're processing payroll, because there's a lot of activity in payroll. Payroll's a big headache that is worthwhile charging more money for, right? So if you want to get more detailed on the complexity that's happening, you might come up with a billing structure that's based on, on like the journal report, which is going to give you which is going to give you each account that is impacted. So you'd have to come up with a different billing structure 
and say I'm billing on the number of accounts that were impacted, not just the number of transactions, because some transactions are a lot more difficult and complicated than others. This one's a little bit more difficult to export and then count the number because it has like these subtotals, but, but you know, you can come up with something in Excel to basically count the number of lines here. We'll talk maybe more about that uh, in future presentations. It's not too difficult to figure out a system to kind of figure that out. So maybe we'll look at that later. One way you can do it is you can just put a, you could like if you export this report by using this up top, export to Excel, then you can use the Excel to count the number of lines. And the most easiest function to use in Excel is just simply a count function, which typically needs a number within it. So the first place you might think to go would be to the debits and credits, but that becomes a little bit more difficult because you have two different columns and there will actually be a total column as well, which might double up the numbers if you use that as your counting field. So the next easiest place to go might be in the number field or actually the transaction ID. And then that's going to count the number of lines that have an, an ID within it. So we'll go into that in more detail uh, when we get to the journal report. But uh, just a general idea, if you want to use this report for like a billing and, and account the number of uh, actual accounts, it should be fairly easy to do that once you get it into Excel using some kind of counting tool, the normal just simple count tool, or possibly there's a count if tool that you can try to use to count the number of accounts that are within the reports and it shouldn't be that many accounts also if you have just do if you're doing this on like a monthly basis for uh for most uh for for most types of jobs so we'll take a look at that more in future presentations